The language used to talk about rhythm, such as iambic pentameter and trochaic tetrameter, can seem daunting, but it needn't be. You know more about rhythm than you think you do. We're all sensitive to it, and we make our own speech rhythmic without even thinking about it. Rhythm helps to clarify meaning in our speech. Additionally, if there wasn't any, what we'd say would be very monotonous and boring. Unborn babies are sensitive to the rhythmic patterns of their native tongue because they can hear their mother speaking whilst they're in the womb. Experiments have found that newborn babies can tell the difference between different languages based purely upon their different rhythmic patterns. This is similar to when you can hear people talking at a distance and you just know that they're not speaking English. You can tell because the rises and falls in the rhythmic patterns of languages differ. You might think that if languages have certain rhythms, it will be difficult or even impossible to play around with these. But you'd be wrong. It isn't easy, though. Not only do poets have to choose words that have the meanings, connotations and illusions that they want to convey, but they also need to fit the bass metre, or, in the case of free verse, the overall rhythmic feel, that they have chosen for the poem. This may have an impact on syntax, or how the poet uses word order and sentence structure. Rhythm relates to the patterns of stressed and unstressed syllables in spoken language. Another word for this is prosody. Syllables are often thought of as the different beats in a word. The different beats that you hear actually correspond to the number of different vowel sounds in words. For example, the word sun has one vowel sound, a short a. Uh. It therefore has one syllable. The word poem has two vowel sounds, long o and short e. It therefore has two syllables. The word together has three vowel sounds, long u, short e and long er. It therefore has three syllables, and so on. The difficulty in identifying the rhythmic pattern of a poem often lies in the subtlety of the stress patterns themselves. We're usually quite unaware of them, but if someone says something with the stress in the wrong place, it sticks out like a sore thumb. The easiest way to distinguish between stressed and unstressed syllables, then, is to look at the same word which alters its stress patterns according to whether it is a noun or a verb. For example, if I say, I need to make sure that I keep a record of this meeting, you'll know that something sounds wrong. What I should have said was, I need to make sure that I keep a record of this meeting. All I did in the first sentence was to use the verb form of the word when I should have used the noun. When we use the noun form of the word, meaning something which is a piece of evidence about the past, such as a written account, we're talking about a record. Note the stress is on the first syllable rather than the second. Record. When we use the verb form of the word, meaning to make a piece of evidence, such as a written account, we say record. Listen to them one after the other and hear the difference between them. Record. Record. The two words are identical. The only thing that changes is where the stress is placed. This is true of other words which can belong to different parts of speech. Take this three-syllable word. The noun form is pronounced estimate. Note that what would usually be a long A sound with the split digraph or magic E at the end becomes a shortened A uh sound. While the verb form is pronounced estimate, keeping that long A sound in the final syllable intact. Estimate and estimate. So, if it's much easier to identify stress when it's wrong, how do we identify it when it's right? The easiest way is to read a line of poetry with exaggerated stress. You'll find that it's actually very difficult to put the stress in the wrong places. Take the first line of Shelley's poem, Love's Philosophy. The fountains mingle with the river. It's much easier to say the fountains mingle with the river than it is to say 
The fountains mingle with the river. If the stress is right, it should sound a bit sing-songy, like it does in the first example. If it's wrong, it should sound jarring or forced, like it does in the second example. Note that when we read the line in a more natural way, which is how you would read it, the rhythm becomes much more subtle. The fountains mingle with the river. In poetry, pairs or triplets of syllables are grouped together into units called metric feet. They usually have one stressed syllable and either one or two unstressed syllables, and these are usually repeated over the line. We're going to look at five different metric feet that crop up in the poems in the cluster and look at them in the context of the poems themselves. All these words come from the ancient Greeks, who were writing poetry long before we were. An iam is a two-syllable metric foot, which has an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, didum. The verb record is an iam. A trochee is a two-syllable metric foot, which has a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable, dumdi. The noun record is a trochee. An anapiste is a three-syllable metric foot, which has two unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable, didi dum. The verb estimate is an anapiste. A dactyl is a three-syllable metric foot, which has one stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables, dum didi. The noun estimate is a dactyl. A spondy is a two-syllable metric foot which has two stressed syllables, dum dum. Spondaic feet are substituted for other feet rather than determining a metrical pattern. So you'll never get a line of poetry written in spondaic pentameter, for example, because we don't talk purely in stressed syllables. The compound noun sing-song is a spondy. So the words I am, trochee, anapiste and dactyl tell us the type of rhythm. There is also terminology related to how many of these are in a line, and it goes back to Greek again. If you look at the table, you'll see that di plus meter equals two feet, tri plus meter equals three feet, tetra plus meter equals four feet, and penta plus meter equals five feet. So a line of ten syllables written in iambic rhythm is called iambic pentameter. There are five feet of two syllables each which go to dum. You'll have come across this already in Shakespeare, as he wrote his plays and sonnets in this metre. So these lines of verse have the same rhythm as if you were to say, record, 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 record. Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poem, I Think of Thee, has a base metre of iambic pentameter, as it is a sonnet. I think of thee, my thoughts do twine and bud. A line of eight syllables written in iambic rhythm is called iambic tetrameter. There are four feet of two syllables each, which go de dum. Porphyria's Lover by Robert Browning uses a base metre of iambic tetrameter. The rain set early in tonight. The sullen wind was soon awake. As does The Farmer's Bride by Charlotte Mew. Three summers since I chose a maid, too young maybe, but more's to do. Note that I've exaggerated the stress there. You would actually read it with a more natural intonation. So a line of eight syllables written in trochaic rhythm is called trochaic tetrameter. There are four feet of two syllables each, which go dumdi. These lines of verse have the same rhythm as if you were to say, Record, 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 record. Percy Bysshe Shelley uses a base metre of trochaic tetrameter in his poem Love's Philosophy, although he varies this substantially and rather confusingly in the very first line, which we'll come to in a minute. The first two lines of the third stanza, though, are written in regular trochaic tetrameter. See the mountains kiss high heaven, 
and the waves clasp one another. What is even more important than being able to identify the underlying rhythm or bass meter that the poet is using is to detect when they choose to break this, sometimes by adding or taking away syllables, sometimes by choosing words that have a different stress pattern. Why have they done this? It's not by accident, and it's not because they can't count syllables. It's often a way of signalling to the reader that the tone has changed, or that they want the reader to focus on a particular word or group of words. One way of doing this is to either add or take away a syllable at one of the ends of a line. When a syllable is taken away, the line is said to be catalectic. Shelley makes a number of his lines in Love's Philosophy Catalectic. Why not I with thine? Here, the line is trochaic trimeter catalectic. Trochaic trimeter consists of three troches. Dumdi, dumdi, dumdi. So trochaic trimeter catalectic is where the final unstressed syllable is removed. Dum di dum di dum. The shortness of this line, in conjunction with the use of monosyllabic words, serves to communicate Shelley's frustration at his mistress's refusal to enter into a physical relationship with him. When a syllable is added, the line is said to be hypercatalectic. A number of the lines in Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnet, I think of thee, are hypercatalectic. And I'm going to read them now with exaggerated stress. Because in this deep joy to see and hear thee, and I do not think of thee, I am too near thee. These, in conjunction with other techniques such as enjambment, disrupt the regularity of the iambic pentameter and help to convey the idea of her feelings being so powerful that they cannot be contained within the strict rules of the sonnet form. Let's now go back to the problematic first line of Love's philosophy, the fountains mingle with the river. If we mark the feet in, we can see that it is written in iambic rhythm, but there is an extra unstressed syllable at the end of the line, so we would say that it is written in iambic tetrameter hypercatalectic. Why has the poet done this? Well, if we look at the next line, which is written in the poem's base meter of trochaic tetrameter, we can see that having an unstressed syllable at the end of the line with a stressed syllable at the beginning of the next maintains a regular double beat rhythm and enhances the idea of the uninterrupted harmony of the flow of bodies of water from the smallest to the largest. Charlotte Mew takes adding extra syllables to the extreme in her poem The Farmer's Bride. Remember that we establish that her poem has a base meter of iambic tetrameter. Didum, 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 didum. However, let's take a look at the fifth line of the second stanza. So over seven acre field and up along across the down. If we divide it up into its metric feet, we can see that it has been written in iambic octameter, i.e. there are eight iambic feet, making 16 syllables in total. We can find a clue as to why Mew has chosen to do this if we look at the episode that the farmer is recounting. He is describing how he and his men chased his absconding bride over the countryside. The double length of this line and the way in which the meaning of the sentence spills over onto the next line through enjambment mimics the speed and relentless nature of the chase. Choosing words which have a different stress pattern than those which would fit the poem's base metre is called substitution. Sometimes a line of a poem which is written in iambic rhythm has one of the iams substituted for a trochee so that the rhythm goes dum di rather than di dum. This is also called metrical inversion. Browning does this in his poem Porphyria's Lover. Happy and proud at last I knew. The first foot is a trochee, dumdi, but see how he reverts to iambic rhythm, didum, for the rest of the line. 
Here, Browning perhaps does this to interrupt the rhythm to signal his speaker's sudden change in mood, as he realises that Porphyria does indeed love him. In I Think of Thee, Elizabeth Barrett Browning substitutes the first three I ams of this line for a spondy, an anapiste, and a spondy. Drop, heavily down, burst, shattered, everywhere. To create a line which is very heavy on stresses, echoing the weight of her thoughts as they fall and smash to the ground. Simon Armitage's poem, Mother, Any Distance, uses rhythm in an interesting way. It is nominally a sonnet, although it does not strictly follow the rules. It has 15 lines for a start, when it should only have 14, and it should be written in iambic pentameter, regular lines of 10 syllables each, with a didum rhythm. Just by looking at the poem side by side with Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnet, we can tell that Armitage has broken the rules. Some lines have as few as four syllables and others as many as 16. What does emerge, however, when you read the lines, is a double beat, albeit trochaic rather than iambic, rhythm that continues over line breaks. Mother, any distance greater than a single span requires a second pair of hands. Another poem which has similar rhythmic features is Byron's poem, when we two parted. This is written in accentual verse, which has a fixed number of stresses in each line, regardless of the number of syllables. In this case, Byron has chosen only two stress syllables per line, so line lengths vary between four and six syllables, which makes the poem quite choppy and disjointed, perhaps to reflect his highly disturbed emotional state. In order to get an idea of how the rhythm sounds as a whole when we read aloud, it's easier to look at pairs of lines rather than just one. When we two parted in silence and tears. If we do that, we can see that the bass metre is therefore largely, but not exclusively, dactylic. Dum diddy. Which, due to the falling nature of the rhythm, where a stressed syllable is followed by two unstressed syllables, makes it ponderous and heavy, yet relentless at the same time, and perhaps reflects how he is weighed down by his sadness at the end of the relationship. A number of poems in the cluster, usually the more modern ones, even though they follow some kind of rhyme scheme, have no regular metre, such as Neutral Tones, Walking Away, Follower and Eden Rock, although line lengths are roughly the same length. Follower by Seamus Heaney is relatively heavy on iams and does have some lines written completely in iambic tetrameter. An expert, he would set the wing and fit the bright steel pointed sock. These lines have a very rhythmic and harmonious feel, which helps to convey the ease with which Heaney's father sets up the plough. Another group of the poems, Letters from Yorkshire, Before You Were Mine, Winter Swans and Climbing My Grandfather are written in free verse, which is an even further move away from this type of structural formality. They have no rules on rhythm, line length or rhyme, and so the language of iams and trochees is largely redundant. Although they have no rules, though, poets can make use of metric feet here and there to enhance the meaning of the line. Take Sing Song by Daljit Nagra. The ends of the lines in a couple of his stanzas have an anapistic rhythm. De worst Indian shop in de whole Indian road, which adds to the feeling of it being a refrain. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.